from the University of Sydney on resilience of tailored surface coats to bias noise. Um, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen. Okay, so um, well, first I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for putting on a great conference in these difficult circumstances. Um, as Barbara said, I'm going to talk about resilience of tailored surface codes to bias noise. This is a mostly new work. Um, it's going to be on the archive soon, I hope. And uh, this very much is a joint work with um, my collaborators, um, Pablo Bonilla, who's an undergraduate at Sydney, who's done some excellent work on this project. And I think the other names are probably familiar to you, Steve Bartlett, Steve Vermeer, and Ben Brown. So um, let's get into it. If I can. Okay, so um, this is an overview, but it's also kind of the messages of the talk, if you like. Um, after covering some background concepts, I'm going to try and tell you that there's basically one surface code for every Pauli channel. Um, we then go into looking at how we can efficiently decode that, that code and um, find some exceptionally high fault tolerant thresholds. And um, I put a little bonus in there. We've got some results just came in the last couple of days, so um, I've included them as well. And finally, we'll cover how we can do uh, fault tolerant computation while preserving that, the bias that we need to get these high thresholds. Okay, so the concepts, um, I think this surface code has been introduced several times already in this conference, so um, I won't go into it too much, but this is what I'm, I'm referring to when I'm referring to a CSS surface code. It's a, a vertice, a qubits on the vertices, and then these X type stabilizers, these Z type stabilizers. And the crucial thing is that if you have an error that anti-commutes with any of those stabilizers, then you get this minus one eigenvalue, and that, that is we refer to as a defect on that face. Okay, there's um, a couple of common ways of decoding the surface code. So this is one of the most standard ways, minimum weight matching. Um, this is where you, you pair up these defects, um, minimizing the distance over the graph. And um, that gives you your, your correction. You treat X and Z separately. So it actually is near optimal for bit flip noise or phase flip noise, but it's suboptimal for depolarizing noise. It doesn't handle correlations between X and Z particularly well but it does have a really nice efficient uh, extension for faulty measurements, so for the fault tolerant regime. The other type of decoding we're gonna talk about because I'm gonna talk about optimal for thresholds, and by that I mean uh, thresholds of a code when they're, when they're decoded with an optimal decoder. So the maximum likelihood decoder um, is that that decoder identifies the most probable logical code set of equivalent errors. And, there is an efficient approximation of this using tensor networks due to Bravi, Stuchara, and Vargo. We use that decoder, though slightly adapted to the rotated uh, code. Unfortunately, there's not a, as yet known a, an efficient fault tolerant extension, fault -tolerant extension of this uh, decoder. Okay, the noise channels, one of the most commonly studied are things like the bit flip noise channel. Here, P is the, um, we're always going to be talking about IID noise here. So P is the, uh, probability of an error on a single qubit. So bit flips um, is X errors occurring with probability P, and phase flip is Z errors occurring with probability, probability P. Obviously there's a, an equivalent for Y errors as well, sort of a Y flip. And then another common uh, channel is depolarizing where X, Y, and Z occur with equal probability. And of course, I said I'm talking about bias noise, so and this is what I have in mind with bias noise here. We're considering Y errors, y errors occurring more frequently than X or Z. And so we define eta as this ratio of the rate of Y errors, the high rate Y errors over the, uh, the rate of the low rate uh, X or Z errors. With this, this sort of definition, the eta is a half, corresponds to depolarizing noise, all equally likely X, Y, and Z. And in the limit, uh, infinite limit, then that's just pure Y noise. And um, similarly, we can define bias noise for X biased or Z bias noise. Okay, the, so um, I'm going to talk a lot about thresholds, so I'm just quickly going to say what I'm talking about. If you look at the inset here, um, we're, pro we're plotting a logical failure rate against a physical error rate. And you'll see there's that vertical gray line corresponds to some threshold physical error rate, below which if we increase the code size, 
we can um, make the uh, logical failure rate arbitrarily small. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about thresholds. The main plot is just to say that when we do our estimations, we're using this critical exponent method um, due to Wang, Harrington and Preskill. Okay, I'm also going to talk about the hashing bound a bit. So um, here's, this is a definition from uh, Wilder's book. Um, and it basically says that there's a stabilizer code that achieves the hashing band. This R equals one minus H of P, where H is the entropy, entropy of the probability vector P for this um, Pauli noise channel. And the proof of this theorem invokes some um, random codes. So the way I'm going to interpret this for, for our scenario is um, this gives a sort of lower bound on the possible threshold error rate for Pauli channels. So if we set R equal to zero for the surface code, because it's a, a zero rate um, code, then uh, we parameterize the probability vector in terms of the uh, single qubit error rate, and then we solve for that rate. And we find then for depolarizing, we have a threshold error rate, um, hashing bound, sorry, hashing bound error rate of 18.9% roughly. And for the bit flip phase flip, it's 50%. Okay, there's an open question here um, of interest to the theory people that um, there's no really tight bounds on this on a quantum capacity. So um, if we see the thresholds above this lower band, that's that's interesting as well. Okay, so this is now okay, a little bit of a history of surface code resilience. When I say surface code resilience, I mean the the I'm talking about the optimal thresholds that you can achieve. Um, assuming perfect measurements and assuming ideal or optimal decoding. So uh, back in 2004, um, Dennis and colleagues um, found the, by mapping the, the surface code to a, a statistical mechanical uh, model, they, uh, they found the optimal threshold of, of 11% on this, on the, this is on the CSS surface code or, or, or toric code. And this is why the, the surface code has been of so much interest to everybody, because this is a high threshold, right? Um, a little bit later in 2012, we had um, Bombin and colleagues um, found the threshold for depolarizing noise was around 19%. This is again using the, the uh, uh, stat map mapping. And um, in the last couple of years, we've been looking at bias noise thresholds on the surface code. And so uh, I'll get into those in the next slide. So here I'm plotting um, the threshold error rate on the y-axis and bias along the x-axis. Um, and the x-axis is, is a logarithmic scale there. So, and that, there's the hashing band that we're talking about. This, this is what should be achievable with, with uh, stabilizer codes, at least with random stabilizer codes. So the bit flip um, rate there is, is this 11% we see down here. This is an infinite bias for the uh, for the X biased or Z biased noise. So it's pure X or pure Z noise, we get 11% uh, threshold rate. The polarizing is what we see over there. That's where E2 is, uh, is a half. So we've got to polarize the noise, we've got a threshold of about 19%. And then we can fill in the gaps there. And we see that the threshold error rate actually falls down, falls quite quickly with uh, with increasing bias. We're already at a bias of, of 10, it's, it's down pretty nearly 11%. So um, what we found is there's a 50% threshold to pure Y noise on the surface code. You might be wondering why that hasn't been found before, but it, it, it's not been easy to decode the surface code with Y noise until, um, until we had this tensor network decoder of Bravi, Sakara, and Vago. Um, but we found this result also analytically. And then we can fill in the gaps then going from depolarizing to pure Y noise, and we, and we find the, 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 bi the threshold sort of track the hashing band. So already at a, I don't know, at, a, at a bias of 10, so you've got your Y errors 10 times more likely than the X and Zs, you've got a threshold of 28% and at a bias of 100 is up at 39%. So these are pretty good results, but these are from, from the last couple of years. I'm just quickly gonna say why we see these high thresholds, excuse the pun in the title. Um, if you look at the how a pure and a logical error on the on a surface code made of just x paralys, it looks like this, and you can deform it by flipping on and off the uh, x type stabilizers. 
And so there's a roughly L squared over two of these X type stabilizers. If we look at a logical on the, on the same code made of just Y errors, well, that's, that's the only one. And that there are no uh, Y type stabilizers on this code, uh, non-trivial ones at least. And so the ways to fail with pure X noise is this two to the L squared over two, but with Y noise, there's only one way to fail. So you might be thinking this is about the distance. It's not, it's, it's about the, uh, the number of ways of failing. We have examples of codes that have the same, don't have this L squared distance to Y noise, but they still have these high thresholds because they have a limited number of ways of failing. So it's the entropy turn that really, really counts here. But we'll talk a bit about distance later as well. Okay, I just want to say this once um, about the tailoring to the phase noise, because obviously we've been talking about Y bias noise on the surface code, but in a lot of architectures, it's dephasing noise is dominant or, or Z bias noise, if you like. Um, it's simple to modify the code to, to be resilient to Z bias noise. You just swap the Y and the Zs, and then you have a code that gives you these high thresholds for Z bias noise. But no, I'm gonna carry on just to treating the code in its normal, in its usual configuration. Um, I should say as well, yes, it's possible to extract the syndrome in information in a bias preserving way. Um, and you, if you saw Shruti's talk uh, yesterday or earlier today, depending on your time zone, you'll see how they did that with, um, or they demonstrated how you could do that with, uh, with um, cap qubits. Okay, so now that was the background. Here's our new results. Then I'll, uh, this is where I wanted to tell you about the um, how there's one code for every parallel channel. So first, I need to talk about what every parallel, what I mean by every parallel channel. So I mean uh, these single qubit parallel channels. Um, so we're varying the error probability of, of the x, y, and z, and we're parameterizing it by this vector r, which is a stochastic vector. And so that gives us this surface, if you like, this is the surface of all uh, R, if you, um, so all single qubit Pauli channels. Um, and the points that I've labeled here uh, correspond to pure Z noise, pure X noise, pure Y noise, and the central point corresponds to depolarizing noise. And what we've looked at so far, we've looked at um, along these axes here, the, the red lines here, we looked at X bias noise or Z bias noise, which are equivalent on the CSS code because of, because of the symmetry. And we've also looked at the Y bias noise, but we haven't looked at any of the rest of the area of this, uh, this, um, this triangle of all single qubit Pauli channels. So I'm, we're gonna visualize some of those thresholds because we've, we've, we've done the simulations. So I'm just gonna show you how we're gonna visualize them. We're gonna take this, um, this triangle and we're gonna lay it down flat. I hope the animation works over Zoom. We're gonna put now um, some axes above this and then the axis goes is the threshold error rate it goes from 10% up to 50%. And the, the vertices again correspond to pure X, Y, or Z noise and the central dot is, is depolarizing noise. And what I plotted there is the hashing bound over this, over this uh, surface. So um, what did we get then for the CSS surface code with, with over this entire surface with optimal decoding again? So this is what it looks like. We've, um, we've got, as we knew already, we achieved the uh, hashing bound for Y bias noise. I haven't plotted the hashing bound here, but I'll show you the, the plot relative to the hashing bound in a minute. But it's achieving the hashing bound for Y bias noise. Interestingly, it also achieves the hashing bound for when Y errors are not dominant, but the X and Z errors are balanced. But as you can see, for when X and Z errors dominate, it really does fall well below the hashing bound. You're going down to this sort of eleven percent for pure X, pure Z. Um, now, if you're interested, there's two hundred eleven points on that surface to make that surface, and that was eleven a hundred eleven estimates to because of symmetry. We, we didn't have to do all of them, but still, it was rather a lot. Can we do better? Well, the answer is yes. Um, if you watch Shruti's talk, you might see this coming. So this is. Um, the XZZX surface code. This is, um, I think, first uh, proposed by Wen in 2003. And this is where you have uh, every 
it's cubits on the vertices again, but the stabilizers are x, z, z, x around each face, and they're the same on every single face. So this seemingly small change to the surface coat can have quite a difference. So if we now look at how we're doing for the thresholds over the surface of all possible Pauli channels, this is what we get. So we're getting now achieving the hashing band for all single qubit Pauli noise channels. And although this is possible with random codes, it's, I think it's interesting that we're doing this now with a code that has local stabilizers and an efficient decoder, as we'll show later. And in some cases, maybe even exceeds the hashing bound. Right? We'll look at that too. So this is the plot relative to the hashing bound. It just shows how the CSS code falls off uh, for pure, whereas X and Z dominate. And it's very close to the hashing bound for, for, um, for the X, Z, Z, X code. And we, didn't, we found it was never less than 1% below the hashing bound. And um, to some extent, this is a qualitative plot because we can do all of those thresholds with large codes but it's, uh, I think you get the idea. You might notice near highly biased X and Z errors, it seems to be picking up a little bit above the hashing bound. So this is something we investigated. So can we beat the hashing bound? I'm gonna say a definite maybe. So here's the um, plot again of the, we've got the threshold error rate on the, on the, on the Y axis and bias on the X and the hashing bound's already shown there. And this is the, th the thresholds we get as we, as we um, investigated X or Z bias noise with the XZZX code. So we see above a bias of about 30, so this is when Xs or Zs are occurring 30 times more, more often than, than the, other, the other ones, so X occurring 30 times more often than Y or Z. We get these, um, these thresholds that seem to exceed the hashing bound. But of course, the threshold is a asymptotic property, so, um, and we are using finite size codes. So we wanted to investigate using larger and larger sets of, of code distance to see if, if this was really, we were just observing some small size effect. These are the plots we got from that. So we, we're we plotting on the y-axis, the difference to the hashing bound. So the hashing bound is at zero and anything above is how much we're above that hashing bound. Um, and then on the x-axis, we're choosing sets of, of different sizes of codes going from the maximum size being 25 up to the maximum size being 77. And you can see it seems to be persistently above the hashing bound, not by, by much, but by a bit more than 1%. For the bias of 100, it, it's, it definitely did have make an effect going to larger codes, but it still seems to have stabilized above the hashing bound. For 30, we haven't, for a bias of 300, we haven't really gone to high enough codes to see what definitely what's happening there. Is it going to keep going down or is it going to stabilize? And again, for a thousand, it's not really clear. Maybe it's stabilizing, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just going down very slowly. So I'm not sure that this is of particular practical interest, but um, in, theoretically, if you're, if you're interested in, in looking at quantum capacity and where it might beat the hashing band, this might be somewhere you want to have a look. Okay, so this is a summary of the section I've just talked about there. So there's one surface code for every power channel, is the idea. Okay, I'm um, gonna talk about how you can efficiently decode the, um, the surface code. I won't just talk about the X, Z, Z, X code, but um, I will get onto that. So we're, first I'm gonna talk about, this is looking at minute, standard minimum weight matching, but just from the perspective of, of uh, symmetries. And so this is the CSS code. I'm using periodic boundary conditions for simplicity. Um, and a symmetry of this code is if we take a product of all of the uh, Z, plaque, Z uh, type stabilizers, then they, that gives you the identity. So this is a symmetry of the code, right? Now every, any error um, of any error code state is gonna be in a plus one eigenstate of this, this uh, subset of stabilizer, this symmetry of the code, because it's the identity. Um, so this, is, this gives you a conservation law. This means that the, number of defects or minus one eigenvalues has to be even. And this is how the standard minimum weight matching decoder works because you just pair up the uh, defects that are the closest together and then you fuse them to find your correction. The standard minimum weight matching treats X and Z errors separately. So it doesn't handle Y errors particularly well, which is why it's suboptimal for depolarizing and it's also suboptimal for Y bias noise. 
So now I want to talk about um, decoding with a system symmetry, by which I mean a symmetry not just of the code, but of the uh, error model as well. So this is on the CSS code again, not, uh, uh, not the, the XZX code, but this is, we're going to consider pure Y noise on the CSS code. This, this, this is what we published uh, earlier this year. Um, now, a symmetry here is um, if we consider a row of, 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 of uh, stabilizers or a column of stabilizers, you'll see that they, the product of them gives um, a product of Y parallels around the, around the boundary of that row or indeed of that column. And then this means then any error that is just with pure Ys just y parallels is going to be in um, a plus one eigenstate of this uh, of, the, of this uh, symmetry. So that means that we we can then have on um, we have this conservation law. So we have an even number of defects along rows or columns, and we can do uh, matching along rows or columns. And this gives us a sort of error bounding cluster, and then we just fuse within the cluster to find the correction. But of course, this is only handling pure Y noise, right? So that's not really physical. How do we deal with um, finite bias where we have some low rate X or Z errors? Well, they weakly violate this symmetry. So we just allow the decoder to um, weakly match between rows and columns. And this, this seems to work pretty well. And the other thing that can uh, violate symmetry is measurement errors. So here we just use the standard approach um, where you just repeat the measurement errors and then the, the uh, defects are, are, are when the, the parity ch changes between uh, adjacent um, measurements. And this restores that symmetry. So, so you have a, a way of extending, extending this sort of, sort of symmetry matching decoding to, uh, to uh, fa um, faulty measurements. So on the XZZX code, actually the decoder is slightly simpler here. So again, I'm, I'm using periodic boundary conditions for simplicity. But if we consider the X, Z, and X code with pure Z noise, then the symmetry is along a, a diagonal. If you choose a diagonal of, of, of faces and we take the product, then we have um, a boundary of Z, a Z parallels around the boundary of that diagonal. And that means then any error made of just Z error, Z, error, Z parallels is, is going um, to commute with, it, with the, uh, this uh, symmetry. And um, we're guaranteed to have a even number of defects along these diagonals. And so to do the map to the decoding, we just match, we're doing matching along these 1D diagonals and um, we fuse the pairs along, the, along them to find the correction. And then the usual tricks when we have a uh, low rate errors as well for finite bias is way work as well. We just uh, allow it to weakly um, match between diagonals and the fault tolerant tricks work as well. So this is, I'm going to refer to as the, the Z bias decoder and the other one is the Y bias decoder. But um, let's have a look at what sort of thresholds we can get with these decoders. Okay, now I said I'm going to look at fault tolerant thresholds. I'm going to start by looking at um, thresholds where Q, which is the rate measurement error rate is zero. So this is not really fault tolerant. This is a, assuming ideal measurements. There's the hashing band again. Um, if we, look at the CSS code with the Y bias decoder. So we're looking at Y bias noise here. Um, we find that the, if it falls below, the thresholds fall below the hashing band, but they still rise up um, as you increase the bias. So this is, this is quite promising. Um, just a reminder, this could be, we could be considering Z bias noise on the CSS code by, just by tailoring the code. And if we look to the X, Z, Z, X code and use this Y bias decoder, we get similar, similar results. But now if we, let's look at the X, Z, Z, X code with a Z bias decoder, and this is working even better. We're, we're now getting near the hashing bound for intermediate bias, I guess, anywhere from three to a hundred, we're pretty close to the hashing bound. And this is, the code is basically simpler. It performs better. Um, it, there's, we could perhaps get the Y bias decoder to work better if we made it add in belief propagation and things like that. But anyway, just in the basic forms as I presented in this, these are the results we get. So how do we do then with um, with the, a fault in a fault tolerant context? So that, here I'm looking at a phenomenological noise model. Um, measurement error is happening at p high rate plus p low rate. You'll see why I've done that in a minute. 
Um, so what I plotted here, these, these lines here, the solid line is um, if we take the, um, the threshold for bit flip noise with this phenomenological model, um, which was found back in 2004 by Ono and, and colleagues, um, this is a, so assuming optimal decoding, then if we extrapolate to, to, to the left towards depolarizing noise, so we're still tr treating the X and Z separately, but we're, we're using that threshold of 3.3, then we get up to, I think it's, it's near 5%, it's 4.95% or so. Um, with the, the dash line is showing what you achieve if you use minimal rate matching. So you, um, you're using minimal matching on, matching on the CSS code for bit flip noise, and then we're just extrapolating to the left. So this is why we've chosen this particular type of queue to, to be able to compare directly with these, these, uh, these lines. So the CSS code with the Y bias decoder, um, it's not doing bad, it's doing pretty well, right? It's already a bias of, of like five. It's a, it, it beats the, uh, the optimal decoder that treats the X and Z separately. And um, it pure, uh, for infinite bias, it's um, up above 6%. But the, now let's look at the XZZX code with the Z bias decoder. Well, this is uh, performing even better. We've got, if for, for depolarizing noise, it really is the same thing as the, in that limit, it's the same thing as the minimum rate matching. So that's why we coincide with that dotted line for depolarizing noise on the left there with where E2 is a half. And then, um, then it rises up and, and for, for pure Z noise, we're up above, above 9%. So, I think these are the highest thresholds we've had for the phenomenological noise model on the surface code. Okay, uh, I want very briefly, I'm going to mention um, some results that uh, Shruti put up uh, yesterday, earlier today or yesterday um, in her talk. So if you, if you want to see these in detail, please have a look at her talk. But um, it's modeling, it's using the XZZX code with the, the uh, Z bias decoder, but with circuit noise. So um, this plot here is just comparing what happens with bias preserving um, C0 gates in your syndrome extraction model compared to ordinary um, C0 gates. Um, it's not taking any particular physical model into account. It's just a, just a sort of a, like a, a generic uh, model, but it, it illustrates the plot on the left illustrates how you're getting a, you're getting a higher threshold up about 2% if you can use bias preserving C0 gates as opposed to the ordinary ones, because they can introduce low rate errors, mapping high rate errors to low rate errors. The other parts of the syndrome extraction, the CZs and the initialization and measurement are, are, are biased anyway. Um, David, sorry, did you say which decoder was being used here? Because it wasn't clear how you, you exploit the bias at circuit level noise. Uh, so, so the, okay, so the, the decoder being used is this, is this symmetry matching one for the Z bias noise. Okay. Um, the Z bias noise on the XZZX code, but then, but then they, I didn't run these simulations, so I can't answer them in detail. But then, they, then they added in the um, the circuit level noise um, model as well. But they didn't find they didn't tune the decoder to the circuit level noise. Or... I I believe they they may, they may well have done that. Yeah. Also, yeah, can I ask it, a it, 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 it's, it is hard. The algorithm is, is, that is what I showed you. Um, and then this is um, how it's been yeah, extended to circuit level noise. Could I ask a question about the previous slide just quickly about the, or is it the one before? Yeah, the ADA is, if when ADA increases, is, is the uh, faulty measurement error rate constant? Q is constant? Um, let me see now. Eta increases well. Let me see. No, the high rate will go up. I mean, it it it, it is the Q is is defined as this P high rate plus P low rate. Um, yeah, so one has to has to plug in these numbers. I, I so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. It's not obviously to... constant. Yeah. No. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, it varies with P rather than E to it directly, but yeah, I'll get back to you on that if I can. Um, okay, so having said that, then the, these, these, the next plots I'm going to show you are also from Shruti's talk. So this is where they've modeled, they've done a noise model for the cat, cat qubit in a driven transmon. 
and um, they found that if if you have a, a, a transmon of size, well, photon number uh, six, then you can even tolerate um, uh, the C not gate errors of, of six percent. And the point she made here was that the, the, the um, you would need a, a with a transmon system of nonlinearity of uh, like ten megahertz. You need a transmon lifetime of about sixty four microseconds, and they've already had a proof of concept uh, experiment that used fifteen microseconds. So this looks very achievable. If you want to, um, I think Shruti might be online if you want to ask her questions about this at the end. But I'll, uh, I guess I'll move on. This is um, the a summary of that section then. So just saying that we can do this symmetry match and decoding and we get these, 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 these um, exceptional thresholds. Okay, this is the bonus one. Check if I've got time. Okay. Can I, I go sorry, David, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Yeah. Just one uh, one slide before, um, just a stupid question. Maybe I missed something. So you're using this X, this mixed code X E Z X, but the noise is Z biased. So there's a lot. Why would you not use a, a Y biased noise model there? Because it's anti commutes with. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, that's uh, that's that's a fair question. So uh, if you if you use a Y biased noise model there, the decoder is the one I showed you for the CSS code. The Y biased. CSS code. The decoder is more complicated because it has to match on these these verticals, these and 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 they have to we have to get them lined up right to be correct about about the finding the boundary around an error. So it turns out that decoder doesn't do quite as well as the as the simpler decoder that's just matching on these diagonals. But there may be a good reason for using um, to, for you studying why bias noise. Well, that's what I'm probably just about to get to actually maybe answer your question because. Because you do have these, if you have the Y bias noise, you have you have this large um, D squared Y logical, um, which gives you gives you lower error rates. So so there could be a good reason to do it, even if the thresholds you, you achieve with your decoder are not as good. Okay, so this is um, just this this is just in this is a, so I'm going to show some sub threshold scaling that we found using these decoders. Um, where if we look at a sort of, uh, XZZX code, um, I'm talking about a periodic boundaries here in this case, um, that is, has co-prime linear dimension, then the logical operator of the Pauli Z is weight D squared. So this is like you'd have the weight D squared for the Y logical on the, on the, code, with, on the code with boundaries. Um, and that means then that at infinite bias, your failures are due to errors that are order d squared d squared over two high rate errors, and that means that well, that's great because that means you you're really unlikely to get a logical failure. And we find that even at finite at finite bias, this effect persists for high bias large p in small code. So it's kind of a small code effect. But um, this plot here is for a bias of three hundred, and we've got um, we're looking at error rates, physical error rates of over 19%. And um, you can see the, the solid lines are fitting to a, a quadratic uh, model and, and they fit much better than, the, than, than, than this linear model. But although this is a kind of small size effect, um, it may still be interesting in the early days of surface code experiments because it may be relevant to the regime they're working in there where the error rates may be high and the sizes of the codes may be, may be small. But there's another effect. So um, it's small p and modest bias, um, or, or with much larger codes. And we expect most of the failures will be due to um, order d, a mix of low and high rate errors. So um, because basically you're just never going to have enough high rate errors to to do a d squared, cause a d squared error. So this ANSATS is is kind of encapsulating that. We've got um, d over four high rate errors and d over four low rate errors. And the n term here is, a, is an entropy term where a gamma is, is between um, uh, 1.5 and 2. Um, this is from uh, Bevland and colleagues' work. So this plot here is, is showing a fit to that ANSATS. Um, and the solid lines are using a gamma of 1.7. And we've got a low bias, a bias of 3, and a low, low, very low error rates below 1%. And we see the fit's pretty good. This um, kind of indicates that our decoder can correct up to d over four low rate errors, 
even in the presence of more high rate errors. And loosely speaking, this means your effective error rate, because it's the lower errors that are killing you now, your effective error rate is, is, is P over the bias. So it's, um, it can give you quite a significant uh, advantage. Okay, this is my last topic. If I, have I got time just to cover this quickly? Uh, yeah, quickly. We're running a little late, but you had some questions as well. So Okay, um, so I just want to, because I always get this question, I remember Earl asking this question back at QEC 19. How do you do bias preserving fault tolerant computation? So we could have, I think, shown this in, in different um, architectures, but here we're looking at lattice surgery, and these figures are all taken from um, Daniel Litinsky's uh, paper, Game of Surface Codes, which is, I think is an excellent approach. The idea is uh, on the on top left, we see a, a circuit where the Zs are T gates and the other ones are Cliffords and Paulis. You push them through, you end up with a circuit of um, pi by eight uh, pro product of Pauli rotations and a, a Pauli product measurements. And even the pi by eight um, product rotation is, is really, a, you're measuring, a, doing a Pauli product measurement with a magic state. So that's what you see on the bottom left. And then uh, bottom right, you, these patches are, are really patches of surface code, right? Or they could be. And um, this one has a, a six sides, so it encodes um, two logical qubits. So our aim is to show that we can do fault tolerant initialization and fault tolerant Pauli measurements um, pr while preserving the bias. So this is um, a patch prepared in a, of two logical qubits, and we're going to prepare it in the logical zero zero state. Um, these are the logical operators of one qubit, and these are the logical operators of another, and I'll leave that last one there. If we initialize the red qubits in X basis and the blue ones in the Z basis, then we are already in a eigen, plus one eigen state of all the shaded faces and the logical Z, and we can correct um, Z errors on the red qubits and X errors on the blue qubits, and the inverse isn't a problem because the, those other qubits are already uh, are in the X or Z basis. And then we measure the uh, stabilizers to project on the eigenstate of the unshaded faces. And then this, this gives you a, a fault tolerant initialization protocol for, for the preserves the bias. Uh, the other thing we need to do is parallel product measurements. This is the more complicated one. So I'll, I'll show this one. The other ones are, um, are more, more simpler to see. Um, we're doing a logical Y on the data patch, which is the top patch, um, and, a, and a logical Z on the, on the um, Ancilla, which is the bottom patch. Um, so here we initialize the blue qubits in between in a Z basis, and they are then in a plus one eigenstate of the boundary faces. You can see if you imagine where the, the, the stabilizers or the boundary faces extended. And then the product of these dark faces yield, yields your YZ, logical YZ measurement. Um, and But that does introduce a twist because we've got this extra, there's five, um, the stabilizer with, with, with five qubits. Um, so the twist introduces a sort of branch in the symmetry, but we can fairly easily adapt the decoder, though we haven't implemented it, we can adapt the decoder to, to this branch to uh, still re retain the, uh, the high uh, thresholds that we saw before. We've done similar uh, adaptations when we adapt for um, codes with boundaries and things, and it, it works well. So that's the summarize that section. Okay, so summary of everything then. Um, the XZZX service code is awesome. That should be the name of the paper, I think. Um, okay, there's a, a bunch of the of the, the things we showed. And perspectives, well, it is awesome, but surface codes have their problems. They are, they are zero rate after all. So can we apply these tricks to, uh, to other codes beyond the surface code? Okay, thank you. Thank you, David, for a very nice talk. Um, very Thank nice you for talking on the Slack channel. Um, I see one question in the Q&A here from Christoph. Um, uh, how does, the question is, how does weakly matching between columns or diagonals for Y bias or Z bias noise work in practice? So I guess right, it's okay. a little bit more yeah, about yeah. decoding. So um, and that's, if we look at this central, uh, picture where we've got the uh, we're matching along diagonals and this this is where we're doing this weekly matching between uh, the diagonals here because of because of the uh, the low rate error causing 
cause breaking the symmetry. So um, the way we, we did this is we just, we did the kind of the obvious thing, I guess. It, um, we look at the error rate for, for the two and, and then we, we um, weight the matching uh, long rows um, much well, in, in taking the log of the error rate, we map, we map match much more um, strongly. So we weight weight the edges along diagonals much more uh, lightly than um, the wet edges between diagonals. Don't know if that answers the question. If you, if you'd want to know the formula for it, it would, you know, it would be in the paper when it comes out. But it's um, it's the same. It was in it was also in the form. Um, for for doing for the y bias matching, it's in the in the uh, the PRL that I mentioned earlier. Okay, it came out last last year. Okay, yeah, you're showing that now. Um, there's another question. Um, oh yeah, this one down here. This PRL one one two four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by Andrew Landall. That sort of seems to overlap with. A, Previous question in the have you investigated the performance of the triangular surface codes where the logical XYZ operators all have minimal weight equal to D? I um, <laughs> think that uh, Ben Brown already said something about it. We thought about it, but no numerics. Oh, sorry, this is already, I think it's already answered. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks for your question, Andrew. Yeah, I, I remember you're talking about the triangular surface code before. Yeah, we, we still haven't done that but it, I think it would be an interesting thing to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's thank uh, David again. Um, and if there are more questions, go to the Slack. And so now we're ready for the next talk. By okay, I'll 